everyone. Uh, my name is Leah Duhon. I'm here with Richard Diaz. We are the Natural Running Network. And today we have some super interesting things to talk about. There's this theory of marginal gains. It's called like the 1% theory. You might have seen it bouncing around. And so that's what we're going to discuss today. That and effort and efficiency. Yes. So tune in and here we go. So uh, we're speaking of uh, uh, Sir David Brailsford. And, you know, just kind of a little bit of a backstory for those people that don't know who he is or have heard of this 1% factor. He was hired by Team Sky, which is the professional cycling team in England that had miserable performances. They just sucked. I mean, short story, they sucked. And uh, he came at them with the concept of developing the team in 1% increments. And he suggested that by making these modifications to their training and their performances and what have you, in consideration of 1% change in improvements on a daily basis, that he felt that within four years, they could win the Tour de France. Turns out they ended up winning the Tour de France in three years. And what's really cool about this and what's interesting about this is the way in which he did it because it wasn't anything that someone might think that they would want to uh, glam onto as a coach, right? So for example, you may think, well, I want to hire Richard Diaz as my coach because he's coached some really hot people and I want to be like them. And he know he's got these big moves and I need these big moves to get me in a better place. Well, that's not what happened. What he did was he looked at things that you didn't think about that incrementally, um, in a conglomerative fashion, collectively caused benefit. So for example, and I'm not gonna belabor this too much, but I just wanna set the stage for this, is that he suggested that, you know what, it's important that these guys rest. When we go on the tour, we're gonna to be in 21 different hotels uh, as we go along the course, and every bed that they get in is gonna be a little bit different, and that means they're not gonna rest as well as they might have if they were at home. So what we're going to do is we're going to make sure that the appropriate bedding is there for them when they get to that town. We'll put our team ahead to make sure they change out the mattresses, change out the pillows, all of which were prescriptive to the individual team member. And that was a big deal, made a big deal. He changed their outfits. He found that, you know, that the indoor riders have much lighter outfits and they were cooler that way. And so they swapped out the outdoor outfits for the indoor outfits, made a big difference. And then collectively, his process was 1% gains, collectively improving little things <clears throat> and carrying the whole concept over and over and over again till ultimately they became world champions. And mm -hmm. this got my attention and I thought it was worth talking about. Um, so we've already kind of got that in people's heads, right? And uh, so we're not going to go through this right now, but I want to talk about a couple other guys that I think were really, really powerful presenters. And one of them was a guy by the name, and I, forgive me, Tom, if I don't get this right, but it's, I, I think it's Tom Connellan. And this guy said something that really jumped out for me, too, because I have, you know how I am. I, I talk about economy and efficiency. This, I used to tell people, my job is to have you find efficiency and in turn, result in economy. Do things that, you know, I always talk about, you don't want to pay retail, you want to pay wholesale. You want to get the same product, you don't want to pay all the money for it. And so I look at performances this way. And I have forever, and I bang that drum with people forever about those concepts. And I've told people, this is my career. I do assessments on you, clinical measurements of the way your body responds to work. And then we start looking at what the things are we need to do in order to address the deficits and enhance the benefits, right? So this guy said something that just never, never jumped out at me before. And he said, before you start worrying about doing things right, you want to make sure that you're doing things that need to be done. So for example, he said, the preface to efficiency should be being effective. So think about this for a minute. And I, again, this is just get, it gets me up in the morning when I see stuff like this. Let's imagine you go to the gym and your MO when you go to the gym is you have these workouts that you like to do. And they may include, for example, 
doing a tricep extension, uh, maybe a bicep curl, uh, maybe leg extensions, leg curls, um, lateral raises with the shoulders, whatever. Now, these are great exercises for developing the specific muscles, but they may not be the correct exercises to select where your task is concerned. So what he's suggesting and what I believe is really powerful stuff and it's take home information, right? is that you want to make sure that you're doing the right things before you concern yourself with how efficiently you're doing things. Because if you start scrubbing off the stuff that doesn't have much value to focus exclusively on the things that really need help and cause those to be more efficient, now you're a winner. What say you, Leah? I like it. Yeah, because it's... <clears throat> It's funny. It just makes me think of someone banging their head against a wall. You know, I'm like, I'm training for a Spartan race, but for some reason, my training plan says I need to be getting all my muscle groups, you know, and doing all this stuff. So here I am using up my energy. You only have a certain amount of energy per day. You know, now I'm spending that doing something that's not really going to help me towards that goal. Not that that's what I'm doing. I'm saying in We're this done. mindset. Right? So and yeah. by the way, we, we, we talked about this before too. Um, there are people that are thinking, well, you know, I really need to build my base. So think about this for a minute. And I talk about this in my book. And, you know, you know, my screwy brain, the way I work is like this just jumped out just now for me. You know, mm -hmm. I poo pooed the concept of base development training as a precursor to everything else you do. I just mm -hmm. think that's a waste of time. I'm not suggesting that the benefits of being more aerobic aren't appropriate or, or good for you or valuable for you. But I just mm -hmm. don't think in the scheme of things, in the sports and that we delve into where obstacle course racing is concerned, that, that that's a, the best use of your time. So you might be getting more efficient at your capacity to put in longer and longer and longer runs and developing a lot of work over the course of 10 weeks or so. But it may not have been the thing to do where the thing to do might have been to focus on your skill sets, focus on your ability to produce work quicker, uh, the efficiency in those processes rather than just trying to put together a lot of work. Yeah, yeah it's a huge shift in mindset because even back when I was doing more of that kind of stuff, the base building, all that, it's so easy to look at what everyone else is doing and be like, oh, well, I'm, I need my long runs to get up to where theirs are in order to be competitive in Spartan races. It's like, no. I mean, the person who wins is the one who crosses the finish line first. It doesn't matter how many miles I have a week or whatever. It's whoever crosses that finish line first. So for me, it was tough with all the things like Strava and all that, looking at it like, oh, but I'm only doing 20 miles a week and they're doing 40. I guess I need to improve this in order to win. It's like, maybe it would help, but there's, from what I learned from you, there's a lot more efficient ways to train well, <laughs> that can get me a lot better quicker. <laughs> it's all about development and it's all about... Um you know, putting the right foot forward at the right time, you know, and again, I'm not trying to suggest to people that are all about trying to get 80 miles a week in that you're wrong. But if your focus is to do a stadium race and you're, you're spending all this time out there pounding the street at a moderate pace, that's not going to get you there. Now, and the flip, flip the switch, if you're going to try to do like an ultra beast or something like this, uh, the last thing you want to do is jump in the middle of your training and start doing a bunch of high intensity, short duration stuff to might prepare you better for a stadium race. So it's just a function of looking at what the needs are and then going after it. But I really like the idea of effective versus efficiency. That just like somebody just slapped me in the face when he said that. I thought, wow, that's so profound. Mm -hmm. And I, I just really, really make it, uh, well, let's do this, okay? Because we, we, we practiced this once already, right? So, <laughs> yep. <laughs> so the, the other thing this guy came up with that I thought was really powerful stuff, and I've seen it done before, and I just, it wasn't in this context. But so like you're sitting there at home, hopefully, as opposed to running down the road. And by the way, if you are running down the road, you need to replay this, this uh, podcast when you get home. And so you need, it's a visual thing too, okay? You got to see it. And I know there's going to be a lot of people that are just going to get audio for this. So you might want to jump to YouTube and, you know, look this up because it's going to be there too. And if you're- We got YouTube, all dressed up just for you guys. You got to get a look at all our fancy outfits. Yeah. And, and if, if, uh, if uh, YouTube's your thing, okay, you're just one-stop shopping. But so here's what I want you to do. I want you to take your two hands, right? 
And then I want you to clasp them together. Boom, like that. And then do it again. And then do it again. And then I'll look down at your hand and what is the dominant digit? I mean, is your right, like my case, my right thumb is on top. Mine too. Which is ironic because I'm left-handed. Oh, you are? I didn't know that. Yeah, so I, cool. Who knew? But apparently I should be a right-hander. I don't know. But hmm. the idea being now, let's try to switch it. So don't do it slowly. Just try quickly to cause the other thumb to be on top. And so uh, I can't. I can't. There, I did it. Got, got messy. But it's awkward, right? So let's talk about this, this exercise that we're doing. Let's assume that this is our task. And initially, that task is complicated. It, and it feels awkward. And it's not natural for us. But assuming that in so doing this, this represents progress. Because you may very well be doing something incorrectly and you're just learning how to make it correct. And what he suggested, and I believe to be true, as a matter of fact, I have preached about this on many different occasions. But he suggested that a small shift in behavior produces a large shift in results. So it's if it doesn't feel awkward when you're trying to make change, odds are you're probably not even doing it right. It should be awkward, it should be difficult, because that's progress, that's about change. And in my world, because I teach people running mechanics, and I'm trying to change the way they're moving to become more efficient, and because it is the thing to do, um, initially it feels awkward to make this change. And I talk about perception. As a matter of fact, in Training the Dark Side, I talk about this quite a lot, is that you're so conditioned to doing one thing the way you do it that not only does it feel awkward to do something that is correct, uh, but it takes time. And you might not even realize that you're not doing the correct thing. <clears throat> you might think you're doing it right, and it turns out that you're doing a lot of the same stuff you used to do. And so you might spend a month thinking you're correcting the way you're moving, and it turns out you're actually doing a lot of the same thing you were doing before. Maybe a little bit different, but nowhere near with the corrections you were making that you thought you were making. And I've seen this time and time again in my lab where people will come in and we're going to make modifications to the way they move. And I used to try to trick them in, into doing the right thing. So it would not, because they're heel striking and I want them off their heels and I want them to get on the forefoot, I might be hollering at them to get on their toes. I'm like, get on your toes, get on your toes. Lord, I don't want them on their toes, but I need to go so dramatically away from what they were doing so that we have this compensation where maybe midway they land where I wanted them to. But if I said land on the forefoot, they would still land on their heel. If I say land on their toes, they land on the forefoot. And when they're doing this, they think this feels really wrong. And they think they're tiptoeing. They think they're like dancing on their toes, where in fact, yeah. what's going on? And then so I took it a step further eventually where, you know, and you saw me do this. I'm sure I've done it with you is where I... I put the iPad on a, on a stand in front of them on the treadmill with a camera that shows them a side view while they're running forward so they can actually see whether, in fact, they're making a change or not. So all of this circles back to the same concept of these incremental changes and making these mm -hmm. little... And I started thinking about what would be a cool project, okay? So if we encouraged everyone, when they get home, if they're running uh, or in the gym uh, to sit down, just, you know, sit down, a cup of coffee and start making a list of some of the things that you think you can do that have nothing to do with your training that are going to benefit you in your training. You know, so start like what I'm, <clears throat> hmm. well, let's, let's uh, talk about uh, sleep. Oh, what, if you, okay. what if you managed to um, make sure that you got to bed early? instead of just wasting your time in front of a boob tube till all hours of the night or, you know, or sit, you know, by the way, I'm, I'm like, I'm so dialed into that. Um, we'll have people, this is kind of sad to say, but I'm going to say it anyway. We'll have people over. We have guests, right? We've had dinner or whatever. And we're just kind of hanging out out, out by the pool and maybe having some drinks and whatever. And it gets to this point in the evening for me, typically it's about eight or nine o'clock. And I'll excuse myself. 
I'll say, yeah, you guys, uh, you guys enjoy yourselves. Um, I'm out. I'm going to bed. And my wife's looking at me like, what the? And, and, and they'll sit up there and gab and, you know, try to create world peace till all, all hours of the night and just, you know, continue to drink more than they should. Uh, not to suggest that I won't drink more than I should, but they're, you know, they're like out there just. But you'll do it before 9 p.m. Like, yeah, come on. <laughs> if I don't my bed, bed, and then I'm going to be up at 5. I'm boom. My, my thing is I'm in by 9, up at 5, seven days a week. Now, hmm. there are other things that I can alter in my lifestyle that would be much more beneficial than just that. But for a lot of people, let's just say that's a starting point. We're going to make sure that we're going to get enough rest. So the other thing that it came to mind, and by the way, this gets complicated if you think about it. It's like the little things that you could do that will benefit you, even though it's not directly tied to what you're actually trying to get done. So mm -hmm. I started thinking about hydration. Now, I know a lot of people out there are really good about drinking a lot of water. And I'm not even terribly sure that a lot of water is the answer. But more people than not are dehydrated. They don't get enough. Listen, I am the worst. Look at right now. I'm, I'm not very good. <laughs> I think I've had like a half a bottle of water today and so it's about going on close to noon. This is my second cup of coffee <clears throat> only because I woke up and I thought, boy, I'm late for this podcast. I got to get some coffee. <laughs> well, and I think also one thing we have to mention too, because I think especially starting off with the waking up early and get, well, getting enough sleep, you said, but also going to sleep, waking up early, kind of that discipline. That's a, really tough one for a lot of people and I think and for me that was super difficult for me to learn that and I'm still not great at it but I'm getting better um but I think kind of the whole point what we're talking about too is incremental gains one percent difference I mean marginal gains don't try to be a Richard Diaz right away necessarily you don't have to go to bed at nine wake don't up at five every single day and if you can't do that you're a failure no that's not the point we're trying to get across if you're getting up at seven right now but you're just feeling tired, wake up at seven, just go to sleep 20 minutes earlier, then go to sleep maybe 30 minutes earlier, keep pushing that back. And then maybe you can wake up at 630. I mean, who knows? It's all about like, I read this thing about like, the changes you make now in like your current lifestyle have to be the types of changes that would stick with you into that new lifestyle. Like, let's say you want to wake up at five or whatever. You're not going to be going to sleep at midnight, waking up at five. You're going to be just, you still want that eight hours of sleep. Now just keep bumping it back slightly bit till you get to that spot. If you're trying to make huge three hour changes in your sleep cycle, that's not going to happen right away. So don't beat yourself up and make small changes. Right. And so another cat that I thought would be interesting to share some information from is a guy by the name of James Clare. Clear, clear. I don't know. But he mm -hmm. talks about habits, since we're talking about habits, right? <clears throat> and um, he, one of the things that he said that, I, that really jumped out at me again was that people, the danger of being overly goal-focused. Overly goal for I can't say it. Forkist. Forkist. <laughs> <laughs> the danger of being overly goal-focused. And so you're, you're so bent on the end product. I got to get to this race. I got to win this race. I got to get on the podium. And all what you're thinking about is that goal. And he suggested that there's essentially two things. There's a system and then there's a goal. And the system is the thing that you do day to day to ultimately get you to achieve your goal. Your focus should be on your system and your system starts now. It starts in the morning. If it's like we're talking about getting up earlier or going to bed earlier or whatever it might be, that day-to-day -day thing you do. So let's just say that, you know, um, you, you've got to narrow it down. Maybe, and believe me when I tell you, simplicity is key. So if you try to do a real big shift, it ain't going to work. You need to take small bites. So maybe you start out with saying, you know what, during the week, I'm going to make sure I get to bed early because I got a lot of stuff to do in the morning, whatever. I'm just going to make sure I get to bed early. You know, and you allow yourself the levity on the weekend to stay up later and party, whatever you want to do, right? But you're, during the week, you're going to get it nailed. And maybe it's just a function of like maybe Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, right? But give yourself the opportunity to have success in those processes on a short-term basis and ultimately will evolve into a much more sustainable goal or, or, mm -hmm. or habit I'm looking for. So, uh, yeah. And, he did, you know, the cool thing about what he does is that 
he fortifies what he's talking about with the research that, that's been conducted. So this might hurt people's feelings a little bit when I tell them this, but it turns out that scientifically they looked at it, it takes 66 days to change a habit. Hmm. So if there's th something you're trying to, to change and develop a positive versus a negative habit, it may take you 66 days. It may take you from three weeks to as much as eight months, just based on how um, dedicated you are to task. So if you try to throw too much at yourself early, it may not go well. You, you, you know, you might fail. And then, so then you start uh, dissing yourself and you start tearing yourself apart and it doesn't work. Other thing that he, the, they did that I thought was kind of cool is they, they did a study, right? And so what they did is they got a group of people and they, uh, they gave them a task. So we want you, let's, since it's kind of a thing to say right now, uh, we want you to go get vaccinated. All right. And so they told a bunch of people, go get vaccinated. And then they took another group and they say, we want you to go get vaccinated because it's going to be good for you. It's going to be good for your community and like that. So they gave a little pep talk behind the task. And then they took another group. And what they did is they gave them the task. We want you to get vaccinated. This is why they gave them the pep talk. And we want you to go on Tuesday, your appointments at nine o'clock. And so they looked at the efficacy of the three processes. And the first group was about 35% um, successful. Excuse me. The first group was 38% compliant. Okay. The second group was 35% compliant. And okay. the final group where they actually had the goal, the task, the date, the time, the appointment, 91% effective. Hmm. And so take this into your, your process when you're trying to think about the incremental things. Yeah. That you're try to <clears throat> so I'm going to make sure that I work out Monday, 9 o'clock in the morning. And, and my workouts are going to be at 9 o'clock in the morning every, every day through the week. Uh, so you schedule yourself. Maybe it's a specific task you want to schedule for. Maybe it's not like a full blown. Oh, I got to go to the gym. I got to get my shoes on. I got to run. I got things to do today. Maybe it's just one thing. Maybe it's just I'm going to make sure that I get um, 16 ounces of water in before 10 o'clock in the morning. You give yourself a timeline. You give yourself a task you're more successful with that task. And it builds mm -hmm. on it. So um, going back to this uh, Dr. Dave, not Dr. Dave, Sir Dave Brailsford, they found that these 1% improvements yielded like a 35 and 40% improvement in performance over the course of a season. These guys actually got a lot. And believe me when I tell you, if you get a 5% improvement in the way you do what you do, that's pretty big. You get a 40% improvement, you're a world champion, right? So it started to turn out like this. And what they found, and I, I'm sorry, I keep referring to my notes, is that a 1% change every single day would be better than 90% of the people that already had the skills. So let's just say, hmm. for, so let's say for example, that your focus was... Um, to improve your running time for a 5K. And you did this 1% incremental improvement on all the aspects of this focus that you're after. Uh, by employing those, those little details every day would yield better improvements than 90% of the people that already had those skills. So let's say, for example, your, your, your focus is you want to beat XYZ dude in a race. And he's already got these skills. And your, your, your application is, I, I just want to beat him one day. By doing these little incremental improvements, odds are your improvements will be 90% better than what he already had, had uh, acquired. Hmm. That's good to know, right? Yeah, it's encouraging. Well, I'm not saying you're going to beat him. <laughs> I'm not saying you're going to beat him. I'm just saying that your improvements in your process is going to be 90% better 
than the improvements that he'll get from wherever he is. So you can start <laughs> chipping away at his, his ability to do things. And, you know, that's, that's what I'm talking about. Right. So, yeah. And I know you went through this, Leah. So aside from me having two simple go-tos like water and sleep. Yeah. What else? Well, the thing I think about it, cause basically you could obviously make people are going to think, Oh, well, what if I get 1% better at the sport? It's like, okay, yeah, that's not really what we're talking about. This is basically 1% improvements in things that don't take physical like effort, not getting necessarily better trying harder you know so for me yeah sleep's big uh sleep's huge sleep is huge food yeah making sure hey if i'm gonna go do my workout yeah i might not be one of those people who can down the perfect meal right before the workout but let's say right now you're just having some crackers or something maybe you can have a little bowl of rice you know it's a little bit better than what you were doing it'll probably give you a little more uh, easily available energy for the workout an easy fix you don't need to say oh well I have to eat this perfect meal before my workout because that's what I'm supposed to do. It's like, yeah, theoretically, that's what you want to do. But try to make a 1% jump, you know, keep improving on that. Um, other big ones, I mean, yeah, just like we were talking about with the uh, efficiency of what you're actually doing. So, I mean, one thing that Sir Dave did is they had them experiment in a wind tunnel so they could make small improvements to aerodynamics, which I thought was super interesting because that's kind of your whole thing is practicing your running form with the video camera, making sure you can improve it a little bit here and here, here and there. Um, so stuff like that, that you're not necessarily improving your fitness, but you're improving your efficiency at the like in your economics and all that or your running economy, kind of like you say that. But um, yeah, I mean, those are some of the biggest ones. <laughs> those words, they get me mixed up. Uh, some big ones. But I mean, also, I think it's just a, like a, a change in mindset. A big thing that Sir Dave said that I really liked is, uh, oh, what was it? It was about how one of the biggest, like, things that this this whole one percent method does like yeah there's the actual improvements you can see but one of the biggest things that it does for athletes and teams is it changes like your mindset so it's almost like a game for people they're like oh well without what can i do to improve without trying harder so then the whole team and everyone's kind of on board of trying to find these little micro hacks these little micro things that can make a difference so yeah i think everyone's is going to be different and i think yeah i mean mine's probably gonna look a lot different than someone else's but yeah i think the big ones obviously one of the things that they they were talking about too and i think it was james clear that was talking about it he said that um there are these triggers to habits um that there's like hot triggers and there's cold triggers right so like a cold trigger would be you make up your mind that on monday i'm going to start working out i'm going to get to bed early I'm going to make sure that I'm hydrated. I'm going to make sure that I eat well. Um, you know, and you just line up all this stuff that you're kind of trying to do. Well, that's kind of a cold trigger because it's not something that is likely to come to fruition. You're going to drop the mm -hmm. ball somewhere, right? So a hot trigger is something that you know you're going to put to work. It's, it's like a no-brainer. It's going to happen. <clears throat> so it may be that what you do is you say, I'm going to go to the gym today and I'm going to give, you know, you, you've laid out a plan for yourself about what you want to do in the gym, what the workout's going to look like. I keep using gym for an example. I don't know why. But let's just say that you have this task where you're going to go, I'm going to go get this done. You come home, you've achieved something. I did it. I went in there and I said I was going to do it. And I did it, right? And then it spills over into other habits. So you knew that you wanted to improve the way you eat, but you didn't put that you didn't put that uh, on your back, but you yeah. you just because, you know, you're so up, you're high on the fact that you did the one thing, you employ the next thing. And it wasn't part of the stress. Mm -hmm. It wasn't a stressor that was part of the deal. It just ended yeah. up being something you ended up putting on top of the process because yeah. you were so motivated. You know, I'm going to Yeah, you wanted to do it. You aren't being forced to do it. Now you're like, oh, yeah, I want to do that, too. <laughs> and it could be the other way around. It could be. So I'm going to eat better today. And because you ate better today, you thought, you know what, I'm going to get a workout. It could be that because you ate better, you're, you're just in a better physical space to want to go work out. So, you know, it's these little things that we, we're not trying to part the Red Sea. Yeah. We're just looking at these little things that are going to add up that's going to make a big difference over time. 
And, and I'm telling you, you know, it's really interesting because where I sit, you know what I do. Um, I have people reach out to me from all over the world. Mm -hmm. And they will write this script of what they want to achieve. You know, well, you know, I've always wanted to do this and this is my times at this and I want to be a world champion and blah, blah, whatever it is. They got this whole list of things that they want to get done. And to be honest with you, without trying to be a, a jerk about it, I don't really give it much energy because if I chase that down, um, I may be um, a culprit in the demise of that of that scheme, right? I want to I want to clear the deck. I wanted to start in the beginning. Let's just back off all that crap and let's look at what's going on today. What are we going to do today? And based on what we achieve today, what are we going to do tomorrow? And start to break it down like that. And then ultimately, again, this becomes the system versus the goal. They give me this goal, and the goal is the preeminent thing that they're concerned with. Uh, and it's not that it shouldn't be something they're concerned with or focusing on, but the day-to-day, -day, the system, let's get up and get it done. Um, the, who is the uh, – I know you've seen this. Everybody in the world has seen hmm. this video. The, uh, the, the Navy SEALs commander, like the guy that runs all the Navy SEALs. He did a commencement okay. speech for some some uh, uh, graduating, uh, I think they were college or high school. But he says that the number one thing that he concerns himself with is when you get up in the morning, make your bed. Mm. He goes, you make your bed, and because you made your bed, you accomplished something. First thing in the morning, you got something done. And then you build on that throughout the course of the day. So mm -hmm. who would think that, you know what, I'm going to make sure I make my bed. I'm going to make my bed, and that's going to put my mindset in, like I'm starting to achieve things today. And I'm going to yeah. start building on that, right? It just changes the uh, the whole complexion of, of how the day is going to go because you physically did something. It's such a simple task. So, you know, someone said, what would you do today? Yeah, I made my bed. <laughs> well, really? Did you it took like five bed? seconds, <laughs> five awesome. full seconds. <laughs> Good for you. I bet, did you change the sheets? So, you know, but but it's <laughs> um, but it's the mindset, it's the shift, right? Yeah. And so, um, I really started looking at this, and I started thinking, how cool would it be to get like you know people listening to this right now, sit down and make a list. Say, I'm going to try to come up with ten things, ten things that I'm pretty confident that I can accomplish that will be uh, effective and then ultimately become more efficient. And this gets into the yeah. workout. So that whatever, the, whatever the thing is that you're trying to get better at. And I thought to even take it a step further, if you just look re reflected on you, and I know you've done this before, uh, you, you had a race and you reflect on your success or failure during that race. What is it that I could have done better? What is it that I've done that was working? What can I build on? What can I delete? Where, where was I wasting time and energy? What can I do to, to make this better? And I would go so far as to take it down to each and every stinking obstacle. Um, consider the terrain, where the terrain came at you. How would you prepare for that? Um, and what kind of things can you do to modify your process as you go through whatever particular obstacle? And or even like, I mean, a big part of races too, is if I'm assuming other people are kind of like me, you'll find yourself kind of having like mental breaks almost at certain times during the race where you feel yourself kind of give up, you know? So the mental part's huge as well. Pay attention to that. Write that down afterwards and then be like, wow, it was about the 35 minute mark and that's happened multiple races now. That's about where I kind of mentally gave up. Maybe that's because I'm only doing 30 minute workouts, you know? I mean, maybe it's, it's just thinking about think, those types of things thinking it through, you know, there's a lot of little factors. <laughs> well, it could have been just add five more minutes to your workout, right? Yeah. <laughs> it could be that stupid. I, I, as a matter of fact, since you brought that up, I just had a conversation with one of, one of my clients and uh, he lives in uh, Mexico City. And he did a race in Ac Acapulco this past weekend. And I've oh, been, cool. this guy's a grip. He's doing the work. He's a hard worker. He's smart. And, you know, if I, if I, Believe me when I tell you, if I say, look, I need you to go bang your head against the wall right now 25 times, he'll say, wait, he'll come back with a bloody head. I mean, this guy's going to do it, right? So he went into this race, not really sure where, where it was going to end up. But, uh, and he was a little disappointed. He came in, I, it, he races elite. I think he came in 18th. Um, hmm. But uh, he got screwed on one of the obstacles and had to do burpees. 
uh, which cost him. He said, "I, ah, to be honest with you, I probably wouldn't have been, uh, I probably wouldn't have been better than about 12th place. Um, he goes, but the long run components of the race, I crushed it. He goes, I, nice. I had people afterwards that were nervous about me because my speed was so much better than it had been. But so he went through and started reflecting on what he could have done better, where he should have done it, and what we're going to work on moving forward. And it, and it might be just little things. It could be just a little change in approach to one thing versus the next. And rather than just, you know, get crapped out because, ah, oh, man, they beat my ass. You know, I, I, yeah. you know, I didn't even get on the, you know. I was so. Funny. I wanted to be first, and now I'm 18th. Like, ah. Uh. He looked at it like a learning experience. He looked at it like a, something that was positive. Uh, he, yeah. He took from it what what he needed to learn, and he's seriously motivated. We're going into OCR World Championships soon. He's going to be there for that. Nice. And our focus is to, you know, get him capable of. And, and I know. I mean, he doesn't look at his competition globally. He looks at it like how he stands in his country. And I know mm-hmm. a couple of the guys in that country that are like the top guys. As a matter of fact, one of them was uh, wanted to be one of my clients. Uh, it just mm-hmm. logistically was really difficult for him, given that he lives in Mexico City. And being a prof- professional in sport doesn't really pay mm-hmm. enough money to travel to California and see a Richard Diaz. But um, <laughs> uh, at the end of the day, um, he's going to beat this guy. I know he is. Mm-hmm. And I, I know the guy. I know how capable the guy is. Cool. This guy, this guy does pretty well on the world stage. I'm not going to use his name, but uh, <laughs> we've got a target on his back, and uh, yeah, and I think that come world championships, he's probably going to, he's gonna, he's gonna throw down. So, cool. That's exciting. So, so, what have I not? What have we not discussed about this concept that would be worth sharing? So I got two quick things, not so much about the concept, more about the habit building. Um, So yeah, first off, uh, exactly what you were talking about, focusing on that, the smaller goals versus just that outcome, you know, I I was a personal trainer for a while. And like one of the first things you learn in the, the training or whatever is focus your clients on process goals, not product goals. And it's basically just that whole mentality of like, instead of focusing on, I want to lose 50 pounds, focus on, or even I want to lose 10 pounds. It's not necessarily making that goal smaller. It's focusing on a process. So it would be, I want to get to the gym three times this week. That's something you can control. You can't control whether or not you win the race, but you can control whether or not you train five times a week. You can't necessarily control, I'm going to run a five minute mile but you can control, I'm going to do 10 speed workouts in this next two weeks, whatever. So it's focusing on what you can do, not on that result that you may or may not have control of all said and done, you know? So anyway, that's just a little more in depth on that one. On that same note, just think that also taking a step back and asking yourself, is this something I should be doing? Is there something that you've been doing that's just been eating your clock and mm. you, you could just eliminate it and make time for yeah. something else that's more important. And, you know, and by the yeah. way, again, I mean, I guess one of the reasons that this, this concept of this, this topic resonates so well with me is that um, I'm all about process with people. And, mm-hmm. you know, I got people that it's like they think they're going to be out with the bathwater as soon as they get next to their friend. So, you know, they go to a workout, they're going to run together and he just wants to beat them. And so oh, yep. up, you know, then, then it's all about goal, right? They want yeah. to beat this guy. So they just throw whatever they can throw at it as sloppy as hell as it could be to try to achieve that end. And I used to bag yeah. often about traditional track workouts. People yeah. hate track workouts. You know why? Because they put their body to task without giving it any consideration for the way they move. So if you yeah. throw your body badly at speed, it results in injury. Uh, worst, worst case, in least case, you're going to be really, really sore. So, you know, I get athletes come back and they complain that their hamstrings are lit. Oh, my God, my, uh, I did a track workout yesterday and, you know, we did 400 meter repeats and my hamstrings are jacked. So you had no business running that fast because you're not, you're not, yeah. you're not ready. You're not running well. If you run well, if you run properly, those problems don't result. And then yeah. your speed will will end up coming to you. And and I'm telling you, as I love when I hear people talk about, 
oh, look how wonderfully he runs. He just such mm. you know, rhythm. He's just beautiful to watch when he runs. That's not that's not a gift. That's work. That's that's that process. That's like making sure you're doing it right and then ultimately end up, you know, achieving the end. Yeah. Yeah, that's what my piano teacher used to. I I did classical piano for like eight years. And one thing my piano teacher always said was practice does not make perfect. Perfect practice makes perfect. And that was always his like whole thing is like, if you're just going to practice for an hour, you're wasting time. You need to practice exactly what I'm saying, even if it feels insanely awkward. I mean, if you've ever played piano, anyone, you know, trying to switch anything up when you've practiced it already is so difficult. Just like that hand clasping thing. It feels so awkward at first. But unless you keep practicing that till that's not awkward, you're never going to get it right. You're just going to be really good at doing the wrong thing. <laughs> yeah, And I've seen, listen, I tell you, that, again, this is right up my alley because I see those solutions all the time. I see people that struggled, that had really a hard time grasping what I was trying to teach them. And then one day that aha moment, it's just like that little moment in time where they nailed it and that felt really good to them. And they started like, oh, yeah, they start <clears throat> gravitating towards that. They start working towards that thing that was working. And then, you know, maybe initially it's like a 10 second episode and then it becomes a two minute episode. Then it's a 10 minute episode and then it becomes who they are. And I have people that surround me that are like this now where, you know, in, in, a, in a lot of cases with people, we're really focused on the details. I got to correct them over and over and over again. I'm watching them very carefully because I know they're going to make mistakes. I know kind of when the mistakes are going to come about and what I got to do to help correct them with that. Where mm -hmm. I've got people now where we don't even talk about it. We don't have to talk mm -hmm. about the details because they got them wired. Now we're focusing on goal more so than, than, than detail. And that yeah. when the detail starts to escape, then we've got to go back to that again. And so mm -hmm. just like piano lessons, you know, you never stop practicing, right? Right. And, and you start to identify when it's a when it's a good practice versus a shitty practice, right? So mm -hmm. it, it, it's it's really the same thing. And I, I've made this analogy before, and I think it was probably with you where I talked about my brother being a martial artist and putting mm -hmm. the, his sigh his sigh in those little ring hanging from the yeah. You know the story. Yeah, you told me about that. It's crazy. But, but I mean, if you know, if if it doesn't go in the ring, it's pretty obvious to you that you didn't do it right, right? So mm -hmm. you didn't have success. And you can't do it fast because it won't work. You got to slow it down and slow it down and progressively. Ultimately, you'll get to that place and then you can repeat it more quickly and more quickly. And running mechanics are that way. And so yeah. all of this has to do with that. And uh, it, it has to do not just with running. It has to do with, uh, again, we're for the most part, our, our audience are, are you know mostly obstacle course racing athletes. The details and the way you do things. So let's take it another step further. The new thing is high rocks, right? So these are mm -hmm. some entertaining challenges because it's not just a function of running. It's a function of going really hard on a skier, going really hard on a rower, um, pushing or pulling a sled that's really heavy. Uh, and all these little details, the way you approach these details can manifest in the process. You get to, get to be a much, much better athlete because you identify what techniques need to be employed. And we, you and I discussed this the other day about the skier. Yeah. I've learned that the focus should be more energy in the initial draw, pulling down from the top, not focusing on pulling harder at the bottom. Little things like that might yield an improvement in wattage. Let's just say, for example, that you're averaging, uh, uh, I'm just going to throw a number out there just for fun. Let's say 200 watts is what your average is when you're going through a thousand kilometers. And because you did this little shift in where your force is, you, you, you earned another 20 watts um, per thousand. And now that makes a difference. I mean, so if you, if you got off that exercise 10 or 15 seconds before the guy that you're competing with, he's got to catch you, right? He's got to make up those 10 or 15 seconds. And in, in a thousand meter run, that starts to make a difference. And if he has to work harder to catch you in the run and you didn't have to work as hard as you would have, the next exercise is going to be easier for you. And if you can gain an incremental improvement by 10 or 15 seconds on the next exercise, now you're 30 seconds ahead, right? And I've seen this. That's play, how you want to race. <laughs> yeah, I see this play out a million times. Well, I was watching the, the race at Asheville. I don't know if you saw the mm -hmm. Asheville coverage. Uh, VJ won handily over a very, very 
you know, staunch field. And, nice. you know, uh, had a really, uh, I was, uh, I'm going to remark on it again, this, this uh, Chris Brown, I think his name is, the guy could run. The guy ran well. I mean, the guy had really good mechanics and he went out of there on fire and he dropped everybody early in the race, but he wasn't as proficient in the obstacles. And so VJ was in striking distance, started making these incremental uh, time lapses on this guy through the obstacles. Made up five seconds that the guy was ahead, started to catch him, right? By the next couple, three obstacles he's into, he's now ahead of the guy. The next obstacle he's in, he's into, he comes off the obstacle quicker. Now he's got 10 seconds on him. Now he's got 20 seconds on him. Now he's got 30 seconds on him. He ended up finishing the race a minute ahead of the field. Wow. And, and because his, his proficiency in his run was solid and his proficiency in his uh, obstacles was also solid, so he threw down 100% game, where a guy that was a really great runner put together about a 60% game, right? Because he was really good yeah. with the running. He just wasn't ready to handle those obstacles. And I mean, I'm sure that, and I told, I, I told VJ myself, I said, dude, watch this guy. I said, because if he learns how to do these obstacles, you're going to have a problem because he can run. You know, he's got that worked out. And, yeah. you know, so my I don't know the guy, but I, my advice to him would be, you know, let's give a little bit of energy to the details that, that are holding you back. Yeah, a few 1% improvements, you know, 1% improvement on each obstacle. He's that much better. Even if it's, you know, if one second means five seconds or 1% yeah. means five seconds. That's, yeah. that's a big deal, right? And, that's five and seconds. <laughs> it starts to add up, especially yeah. when you get into no, a very sure. competitive field. You know, some people, yeah. uh, you know, a minute or two is, is. Well, what was that race uh, last week or something? I forget who it was, but it was like the three top guys and they were only, what, like 15 seconds apart or something. Like crazy close. There's some super that was that? That was in Asheville, was it? I don't know well, what it was. More but common, It's been more common over the last couple of years, especially in the female division. The the top women are, they're just killing it, man. They're They're like. They're very, very close to one another, and, and there's no room yeah. there. If you if you screw anything up, it's over. Uh, it's certainly mm -hmm. in a super or a sprint race. Uh, the longer the race, the more forgiveness there is. But you know, even there, you know, if you lose, if you end up having to do a burpee in a beast race, that's going to cost you 90 seconds, and 90 seconds to make up even at least, right? Well, I mean, depending on good at you, good at it you are, and whether you cheat. <laughs> But, but you know, cheat. How do you cheat? <laughs> well, I mean, I, you know, I mean, you could do the burpees and not do the burpees. You know, I, I don't like this real broad stance. You know, where the legs are real far apart. And oh yeah, touch and, and the little like yeah, the at little, the top. Yeah, you know, I mean. Hey, but I also have heard about that though. Like, I saw this thing about CrossFit or whatever or something. Like you, okay, I don't like this, but it's you. You learn to play within their rules. So if they're gonna allow it. You do it. I mean, why waste time? You know, well, and effort. Yeah, yeah. I mean, let's, that's I get that. Topic. But I mean, you know, we were just having yeah. a conversation about, um, <laughs> you know, the the, um, the volunteers on the course. You know, um, they got their own set of rules, right? Yeah. So it oh, may gosh. be good for you, but not so good for somebody else. You know. They, they, right, and that is a tough one too, because yeah, they don't really have real refs or anything at the obstacles. So it's a well, yeah, I know, I mean, it's a little different. <laughs> I had this conversation with my guy just yesterday, and he was like. You know, he said, uh, this guy wronged me, and I had to do burpees. And after the race, they realized they were wrong, and they apologized. Shit, I said, thanks. Yeah. I said, what did that apology get you? He can't give you back the time you lost, right? Yeah. Right? So, oh, gosh. What if it was money? I, what if I am very opinionated about that. Like, if if Spart cause Spartan has all this weird drama they've had with like people not following rules and them DQing people and all that, I'm like, if you really want this to be like an official big sport and all that, you gotta dial in that. I mean, no one's gonna respect a sport that has 16 year old volunteers determining the outcome of a pro race. Like, that's ridiculous. Yeah, well, <laughs> it would be a light number. I mean, uh, super on average, 20, 20 to 25 obstacles. Uh, yeah, and a beast like 30, 35 obstacles. So uh, legitimately, you should have, you know, as, as many uh, judges as you have obstacles. And then yep. people out on the course that are, you know, making sure everybody's doing what they're supposed to do there, too. So, yeah, I mean, it sounds ridiculous, obviously, because it costs a lot of money and all that. But I mean, if they really want to 
be official. I mean, they're going to have to do something like that because this is just getting kind of crazy. And I feel sorry for all the people who've been uh, <laughs> hit with it. But even you think if a if a if a volunteer or whatever you don't do it quite right or something, but they don't know the rules well, they yell at you. Even if it takes you five seconds to like stop, figure it out, and then like no no no, I'm good and run. That's five seconds. Like for a lot of people, that's the race, just like we were talking about. So it's like. I had Crazy. this conversation. It's kind of off point, but kind of on point at the same time. Yeah. <laughs> I had this conversation yesterday with uh, Jack Bauer. Uh, oh yeah. Jack Bauer's Mister Statistician. Statish, how do you say? Stat statistician. 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 The guy. That, the guy that looks at a lot of numbers. <laughs> so yeah. He, he, a nerd. <laughs> yeah, there's a, there's that too, but uh, he you know he knows more than anyone the details of how these races come about. Um, and I, I posed a question to him. I said, Jack, I need some help. What do you figure the average finish time is for elites, men or women, average for a super sprint beast? And then age groupers, average finish for those same events. Are you saying across like all beasts ever an average finish yeah, time so like yeah i'm just trying to look at a collective process so if you oh, okay. say on average if you were to do a beast and you're kind of average you should finish in x time okay and then i asked him i said can you tell me also what the average completion time is per obstacle i'm curious right so i'm really getting nitty-gritty yeah. with this and yeah. he said you know unfortunately in most of these events they only have three timing mats and, you know, yeah, that's right. So they can't time the, they can't give you a timeline on how long it took you. Well, like a split in, in triathlon, you have split, splits. Yeah, they'll tell yep. you how, how long it took you to get out of the water, how long it took you to get to the transition, how long it took you to get mm -hmm. out of the transition, how long it took you to get on the bike, you know, so on and so forth. They give you all those details. And, yeah, you know that's useful. So you can start to see where you can start to hone in on on change. Um, yeah. Yeah, talk about the whole 1% thing, triathletes and their transitions. I mean, that's like one of the biggest things. They're like, perfect your transition. Like, Well, yeah. The again, I was, I, uh, before we do these shows, I always have a long conversation with myself about the, the things I like to think about or talk about. And I have mm -hmm. a history in triathlon. And, you know, I pr produced the first pro race for CBS Sports in 1984. I've been around it forever. Mm -hmm. um, and so triathlons are geeks. We were talking about geeks, right? And, yeah. and, I, and I thought to myself, I said, should I really call them a geek or should I just suggest yeah. that they're, they're passionate, right? It's kind of the same <laughs> thing, right? Um, but um, I used to know a guy back in the day before there was carbon fiber bikes. He would take yeah. a drill. I swear to God, the guy must be doing crystal meth or something. He would take a drill, like a small <laughs> drill bit, and just make little dimples all over the frame of his bike, the chain ring, the crank arms the stem, the seat post, just to progressively reduce the weight of his bike. Like he'd be poking a hole through it? It wouldn't be a hole, just a dimple. So try to imagine huh. you're trying to drill into wood and the bit goes yeah. in just enough to create a dimple. So it's just taking out a little bit of the metal. Because yeah, gotcha. the fear is that if you go in too deep, you're going to degrade the, the integrity of the frame or the bike, whatever it is. So you just put yeah. these little dimples. <laughs> And, and I'm like, what the hell did you say? And he goes, dude, I think collectively I got like two ounces off my bike. But he wanted those two wow. ounces, right? Yeah. I said, why don't you lose five pounds? <laughs> you know, mass, you're moving mass down the road. I mean, just lose five pounds. But uh, that's how detail-oriented these guys can be. And, yeah. um, and these are things outside of their physicality. This has got to do with the equipment. What can you, yeah. you see my space age like racing helmet? I was sharing that with uh, somebody. I did a bike fit. Um, hmm. Yeah. Day before yesterday for somebody that's going to do their first triathlon. And I was introducing oh, cool. them to aerodynamics and, and explaining it to them. And you were talking about yeah. aerodynamics, you know, the guy in the wind tunnel you're talking about. Yep. I did a podcast with that guy, <laughs> mm. John Cobb. John Cobb is the number one huh. aerodynamic specialist probably on the planet. And wow. every professional cyclist worth their salt, world champions, have been to see John, John Cobb to get into a wind tunnel with him. Hmm. All right. Somebody's texting me. Hey. Um, and uh, he started breaking it down for me. So these are incremental changes. These are like the, the one percentile solutions. 
He says, the, the brake cables on your bike, they get in the wind, right? He goes, that will, yeah. that'll rob you of eight watts. So what he does, he says, the average human being on a bike can produce an average of about 200, 250 watts, mm -hmm. you, know, on, you know, on average. He goes, the bike, because it's breaking the wind, you start subtracting the force production you're creating. So you're the engine. The bike is the hindrance to you pushing it down the road. The wheels mm -hmm. will take 30 watts each. And you start starving <laughs> your production of force and progress based on pushing that mass, which is the bike, through, through space. Hmm. By improving the aerodynamics of the wheels, you get back 60 watts. You get into an aero position on the bike, you gain 100 watts, and you start maybe turning the negative into a positive, right? Now you're producing more force because you have less resistance. And, and that's what they yeah. do, are trading watts. And yeah. we're not nearly that geeky when it comes to obstacle course racing, but I think it's worth thinking about, don't you think? Well, and it's kind of like everything you've been saying. I mean, it's the whole pain wholesale instead of retail thing. I mean, if you can make it cheaper, if you can make the bike more aerodynamic, so you're not expending as much energy to move it through space, you're paying wholesale, you know, and it's the same thing you always teach us with the running is, yeah, fix the running form in just the right way. And it's basically the same mindset. The devil's in the details. The devil's, devil's in the details. Well, yeah, I think we've pretty much kicked this can as far down the road as we possibly can today. <laughs> uh, but my hope at the end of all this and my hope actually going into this was yeah. um, to invoke some thought for people to take a minute and just think about what little things that they might be able to do that are not as difficult, not as costly to produce, that will yeah. start developing incremental gains for them. Well, and I want to, you can cut this part out if you want, but it's just a funny thought I had from this show I was watching last night. They came up, this is going to be a chart thing, so if people want to see what I'm doing, they're going to have to look at the video. So <clears throat> this is the, like, what... Okay, there you go. So there's like your your racers, you know? All right. Now, or that way, I guess. But so it's the whole incremental gains thing. Let's say this is your athletic level down here. You're this one who's not super duper. Your fitness level isn't as high as this person. But on your best day here, this is like your best, you know, that's your worst. Your best day, you could still beat his worst. All right. Let's just say fitness wise. He's running a five minute mile. You're running a six. But in a race, if he was doing really bad, you were feeling really good, you could still beat him, maybe like 5% of the time. Now, let's say if you make these types of incremental changes, so you're sleeping well, you're rested, you have your nutrition dialed in, you have all these things, so that you're way more likely to have your best day on race day, that's the kind of stuff that's going to make you win a race, you know? If you're not taking care of these little things, let's just say no improvement in fitness whatsoever. If you make sure you have your best race day, you have a chance. So it's, it, I know it's kind of like a silly little diagram no, and a silly that, way to think about it. That's but... brilliant. And you want me to cut that out? That's not going anywhere. <laughs> that was brilliant. <laughs> I'm glad you shared that. That's, that's really good stuff. Well, I, I will admit I got that kind of off of a TV show I was watching last night called Hunter Hunter. So, but it yeah, applied. Um, you know what? That's called an education. <laughs> that's what we want to do. Yeah, you know, there's nobody that is just there and all brilliant and, and, and did not get any of that brilliance from somebody else, right? We're like I said to you earlier. I said we're all just squirrels trying to get a nut. We just we're just <laughs> trying desperately to improve our processes, and you know we are lending each other information in order for us to get into a better place. And uh, I'm I may not come off as the most humble guy in the world, but I promise you, I promise <laughs> you that I pay very close attention to greater minds. And I pay really yeah. great close attention to people with lesser minds because you learn. Everything we do, every influence we gather is a learning process. Yeah. And so, yeah, I re the chart thing was huge. As a matter of fact, I had a chart that was very similar to that. And <laughs> I just didn't take the time to, to put it up. So, <laughs> okay. Hopefully, people watch the video well, and they can that's appreciate definitely a keeper. it. I'm, I'm absolutely. You know, as a matter of yay. fact, I'm going to copy that, you know. So I learned from you today. That's awesome. Oh, yay. Yeah. Contributed. All right. Well, look, so <laughs> awesome. let's get some go-home music. Should we get some? Sounds good. It's been a pleasure, Richard. Yeah, it was. Let's see. For both of us. Let's see yeah, it's a fun one. Just, I don't even know if this is going to be good music. A little more mellow. Yeah. I like it. Like raindrops. 
Yeah, it's like bits of information coming from the sky. <laughs> this just makes me like Owl City. I don't, I don't know if you ever listened to Owl City, but this is like... <laughs> Anyway, all right. Have a good one, Richard.